Welcome to Mental Healthy, the podcast where we share stories of the professionals and experts worldwide working in the mental health field. Here's your host, Dr. Kenyon Knapp. Well, welcome everyone to the Mental Healthy Podcast. I'm glad to have you with us here today. I've got a really neat guest that I've uh, met recently, I guess maybe a year or so now. And uh, welcome to the program, uh, Dorcas. Thank you, Kenyon. It's really a privilege to be here. Well, I'm grateful to have you here. Um, I tell you, we're going to get into your topic here in just a minute, but um, why don't you tell the guests a little bit about yourself and and where you're from and um, just a little bit about your background. Thank you. Um, Well, I am now living in Forest, Virginia, so that puts me very close here to Liberty University and the hub of activity. Um, but I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, then went to school in Missouri, and then Virginia, and Ohio, and uh, landed here in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, actually 1979, years ago, and working for the missions department at Thomas Road Baptist Church, and, and of course, connected with Liberty. So um, this is my home now. And and that's after 22 years in Europe. So lots to talk about with that. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Um, The the guests will recognize that uh, in recent weeks, we've had a number of guests on about member care counseling Mm -hmm. and serving God's global workers around the world. And that's part of your background, which is awesome. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. And I know our guests will as well, but, but let's sort of go back to the beginning a little bit. I mean, you mentioned Cincinnati and, you know, working in the missions department at Thomas Road Baptist church here in the seventies. Um, could you tell us a little bit about where your love of missions began and maybe some formative things in your life that led you into this kind of work? Well, that's my, that's my favorite ref- reflection. So yeah, I'd love to. Um, Growing up in Cincinnati, I was in a very, very good church. The pastor was Dr. John Rawlings, and folks at Liberty know the Rawlings School of Religion, and and Dr. Rawlings was my pastor growing up. And one of the things that was most memorable for me was that our church was filled with missionaries. Every year was a huge missions conference, so I literally remember the time I was three and my dad lifting me up and being face to face with uh, Dr. Edward Jelly, a missionary to India. And that was my first face to face introduction, but it was obviously powerful that I can remember it. And then our home, my parents were amazing. We were not wealthy by any means, and but they had an open heart, they had open hands, and always an open home. So we had this rich heritage of missionaries coming into our home, sitting at our table. And so from a child, I learned that they were just real people. Uh, While they were special at church and often seen as kind of spiritual giants, the truth was I knew them sitting around a table of hospitality and hearing their stories. So I think that is definitely where it began for me was showing hospitality from my family to them, but hearing their stories and hearing the challenges that they were facing. And I I loved it. And then, of course, being involved in the church, having exposure to them. And actually, it was a missionary who led me to Christ when I was 11. And she was staying in our home and too far along in her pregnancy to travel. And there she was and on her way to Ethiopia, Africa. And she just asked that question, Dorcas, how can I go share my faith with these young women over there? I really want to know that you know the Lord. And so that's where I came to know Christ was in my home with this wonderful spiritual mom as a missionary. That's where it began. And then coming, of course, to Thomas Road years later after Bible school and training in missions, Um, Having exposure here to the incredible speakers that uh, Dr. Falwell would have at Thomas Road and and at the college. And so, yeah, Dr. Joseph Zahn and Helen Rosevear and real, real heroes of the faith. Um, All of that influenced me, but it was exposure and then working in the missions department, taking teams of students 
to, at that time, over 26 countries for me. So awareness, I think, was the greatest gift that I received in knowing the needs of missionaries and how to respond to them. So that's where my love for member care began, because I realized, wow, we have the best frontline soldiers on the field. Who's taking care of these folks, you know, so that Mm -hmm. they can, of course, be light and salt in the communities or areas where they were working. So that's where it all began. That's awesome. It's a very personal thing for you. The it is. She led you to the Lord. And mm. so, the, yeah, you're right. These people are spiritual giants in a lot of ways. But then you also saw the other side of their life, too, that there's a lot of stresses that come with it. So they're human, but they're also really very solid Christian people as well. And um, I know from my work with you that that this has led you into some missionary member care work. So why don't you maybe tell, you gave your testimony there, but um, between when you were a child up to the present or or, or in your uh, little past when you were a child, you got into member care work. So tell us some of the events and influences and all that led you into doing counseling work. Yeah, that is that is a great question because um, I think – we have our stories too, right? I said I love mm-hmm. the stories of missionaries, and I did, but I realized I have I have a story too. We're we're all living epistles, mm-hmm. right? And the message is being written. And I think my exposure, especially coming to Liberty to Thomas Road, taking students abroad, um, I had been and I had been to South America and I'd been to Europe before that time. My real love was initially to go to work in a French-speaking country in Europe. And um, when that didn't work out the way I thought it would, coming here allowed me exposure to more areas of the world. So the Philippines and New Guinea was my first assignment with Thomas Road, taking a team there. And when I was traveling with these teams, obviously I was focused on helping the students and doing the administrative work and things. But I would have more time with the missionary wives, the missionary kids, and of course, Mm -hmm. with the missionary pastors themselves or whatever area of work they were doing, educators, medical staff, whatever. But hearing their needs and realizing that they needed encouragement, that's such a basic thing. You really don't have to have a Mm -hmm. clinical background to encourage. But when I kind of was challenged by Ecclesiastes 10, which tells us the, you can just chop a lot more wood, the sharper the axe is, you can do that. Mm-hmm. That's what actually led me to go back and get my degree in counseling, my master's degree here at Liberty, because I wanted to take skills with me. Skills are always transferable. That's the beautiful thing mm-hmm. about it. And I wanted to take those skills with me while I was on the field at that time doing just short-term work. So it was anything from taking a good book, resources, to the missionaries. I started packing my suitcase with, maybe it was perfume for a missionary wife, you know, or at that time, this is way long far ago, but cassette tapes with music or messages and things that they could have, which back in the 80s, that was just really a, a great gift. But I had so much joy from that and then studying also and then understanding the complexities of our own selves. We're, we're all Adam's race, right? Fallen, flawlessly. We're not flawless. We are definitely flawed by the nature of sin. But when we take our gifts to another person who's doing the work of God, it's incredible joy. So that's always my question for young people who are training in psychology or in ministry of any aspect to ask them, what is it that brings you maximum fulfillment, but minimum frustration? And when we can kind of identify that, and and I did along the way, finding that, oh my goodness, it's really just encouragement. It's being there at the point of need and being able to respond. So that fits fits hand in glove with psychology and counseling to understand the needs of people and being there to respond and provide situational support. 
Absolutely. Well, listeners, I think you're getting a feel here right now for why I really wanted to have Dorcas Harbin here on the the podcast today. Um, a lot of the listeners, you know, Dorcas, I told you are graduate students and and some professors. And you mentioned you got your counseling degree from Liberty University. And now you've gone out and you've done it. I mean, like you've done what a lot of students dream about. Um, obviously, missions are really close to your heart and it's been a part of your whole life. But um, I know from our previous discussions, you've been to at least 51 countries now around the world. Yeah. And, and, and so, you, well, yeah, you've served at like 51 countries around the world. And then um, because helping missionaries and encouraging them and maybe some clinical stuff if that was needed, um, you got a counseling degree and then you started an organization um, one another ministries international. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the history and your motivation behind starting one another? Sure. Um, and, and, ha- and how did you get it all started? I mean, there's, I know starting well, a new organization, there's probably a lot to it. <laughs> well, and, and I should say I was one of the, the three co-founders because Dr. Robert Luger, who's also had been here at Liberty and we worked together in the missions department and Dr. Rick Lang, who also was had Liberty Days and also was able to take teams of students um, back in the 80s when into parts of Northern Africa. It was such a challenging time and rich experiences. So the three of us were colleagues and, and really good friends. I kind of was a real support team to the Lugers, dear friends, and still are. And um, Robert was given an assignment. They were They went to France as church planters. And in his time there, he was seeing the needs of the missionaries were coming. And because of his background also with the doctorate of philosophy and behavioral science and um, and the same with Rick Lang, who was in Haiti and then served in Kenya and, oh my goodness, Sudan and wherever it was hard, that's where Rick would be. And so we all shared a lot of different experiences but um, Robert challenged me with um, with a question about helping them because he had just been given an assignment by their mission agencies. Um, you know, like basically, Dr. Luger, you have all this experience in this education. Can you help the folks on our field, which was France? And at that time, Kenyon, um, the attrition rate in Europe was 40%. So in other words, four out of every 10 missionaries we were sending, they were leaving the field in the first term of service, which at that time was normally four years. That's horrible, you know. And in France, it was even worse. It was 60% because it's a very dark, spiritually dark country. So we, we would talk about these things and issues. And I made a trip to France to visit the Lugers. And um, we were talking and I'd been journaling about my deepest desires, Lord, this is what I would do. And I remember writing, carte blanche, what would I do for the rest of my life? If resources weren't limited and time, what would I do? And I had said, I would do nothing but encourage and help missionaries to do their jobs better because they're the ones that are going to have the longevity. And um, that, of course, led me into studying. But after doing that, um, you know, Robert and I were, were talking and, and then with Rick and we just um, he just said, why don't you come and help us with this project of helping missionaries? We're going to start a ministry to do that. And of course, I thought I was too old to do that because I was man, I was in my late 40s, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that what only what I could bring, I realized, was my experience and the call of God and passion to to help missionaries. So the three of us co-founded, we just said there needs to be something on the field. In other words, kind of like the mass unit. You know, after World War II, we lost all of our resources and soldiers. And then the Korean conflict broke out in 1950s. And we didn't have the same soldiers to replenish the fields. And that's when the U.S. Army developed the MASH unit, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. That's what it stood for, where they could take the soldiers that were there, experienced, trained, great soldiers, 
But if they were wounded or if they were challenged, they could triage, they could assess, and then they could help and redeploy. And that helped their issue. Well, that's how we began to see it with missionaries. We can't lose these skilled people who are already great with language and have been acculturated really well. Rather than sending them back and losing them, they were too valuable to lose. And that's the title of a great book, um, which Robert ha happened to help do some editing on that and contributing to it. So we began with this dream, and that really culminated by lots of prayer and me being willing to go. And that was pretty late to me at that time, was late in life to go. So we began one another ministries in July. It was July 7th, 1997. And actually, we were close by up at Afton Mountain. And that's where we kind of began to map it all out, put it together, prayed over it. And we said, yeah, let's do it. And I was willing also to go. Now, that was leaving comfortable Lynchburg, Virginia. And um, but my sister and brother-in-law had been in Brazil. They served there for over 35 years. Our family was so missionally oriented. I felt like I'd always had the support to do whatever God called me to do. So that was the beginning, and it was based on the needs that we saw then. Well, now take that 27 years forward, and here we are with much more diverse complexities on the field, which required much more trained, skilled workers. And that's why I love this group of graduate students. You know, I'm just saying, wow, the sky is the limit for you as far as using your clinical skills to be there at the point of need. And that's that's exciting. And that makes me very happy that we were one of only four field-based centers at the time um, when we began. And now that has changed, thanks be to God. And member care has grown into a large discipline of missiology. At that time, it was it was really only about 25 years old. And uh, one of the key elements that helped me at that time was reading Dr. Kelly O'Donnell's book, Missionary Cost, colon, The Cost of World Evangelization. And that's really what it boiled down to me to say, wait, if we could be there for one another, if we could come alongside, we could help prevent this attrition rate. And uh, better than that, we would retain some of the most skilled workers, global workers in the world. That's awesome. It really is. And um, I should tell the listeners, too, that um, as Dorcas and I have become friends, um, you've been a consultant to me. Uh, about member care, you've been teaching me so much. And um, what it's resulted in is here at Liberty Now, our continuing education department has a certificate program in member care. Uh, we've, we use the secular title for it. We call it international cross-cultural counseling. But within the Christian community, we call it member care, which is a euphemism for counseling for ministries, for, for missionaries, excuse me. And um, so you've done so much to to teach me. I, I really appreciate all the way you've been mentoring me in this whole field. But but you mentioned you started the ministry though in 1997. One another, um, tell us a little bit about the ministry. And it, could you mention the website by the way too? Because sure. people might want to click on their computers and check Let's that out. That. The website is simply www.oneanother o n e a n o t h e r dot com. And um, there, and when you go to that site, um, you'll see that one of the primary things that we based the ministry on was focusing on the four needs that we felt were there. And this is long before we started seeing the um, accumulation of presenting needs. The four bases that we chose then were consulting, counseling, training, and resourcing. We felt like it, those were the legs of the table that was going to hold up a platform where we could really serve and meet the needs of those global workers. And that hasn't changed. And I'm grateful to God that it hasn't. It's carried us through. And along with that, of course, we had core ethos that we developed. And one of those is providing a place of safety for missionaries. Everybody does have a story, 
but everybody needs to tell that story in order to continue and allow that epistle to still continue being written by God in the world being able to see it. Um, you know, speaking of that, telling those stories, one of my favorite quotes is Dietrich by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said, it is the darkness of the unexpressed that poisons the whole being. And there he was, a German fabulous pastor, theologian, but mm -hmm. incarcerated during the Nazi regime. And he chose to respond correctly, and he began to write. He began to write his feelings and his thoughts, and he continued doing that while imprisoned and left us, my goodness, a tremendous legacy and treasure of resources. And I love that quote because that is exactly what we need to provide for our global workers, is a platform where they can tell their stories. They can process life. And, um, you know, that word confession, we sometimes think of it as a litany of sins, but it really means to verbally process. You know, if we confess with our mouths, the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. That's what, you know, Romans tells us. And it's the same with anybody in any work. Uh, and the world does it really well with debriefing. And now, thanks, thankfully, and with member care, we're providing a platform where we're allowing missionaries and global workers to process what they've experienced. So those are our, that's how we began with those four prongs. And then as we as we began listening and working, and by the way, you can see it on our website um, under the About Us column, you'll find an annual report. And as of the end of 2023, we've now worked with 9,220 different missionaries. This might be in a training event, it might be individual counseling, it might be small teams, but that's how many people we've worked with. That's amazing in 27 years. And that's all to the glory of God. But that also represents people, missionaries, workers from 115 different nationalities. Because the Great Commission is not just for North Americans. It's for the mm -hmm. whole world. So it's it's exciting for us to be privileged and work with missionaries who are from other countries, but going to other people groups. And then, of course, um, they represent serving in over 150 countries, um, the ones we've worked with. And they also represent over 300 agencies and organizations because we determined from the beginning to be independent so we could be objective and safe. So that's one of those core ethos is provide safety and confidentiality. And when we, any of us, when we feel that, when we have a close friend that we're, we feel safe with, we're able to share our hearts and our lives. And mm -hmm. they help us. They help us process it. They help us reframe events in our lives that we think are awful. But with God, reframing is adding wisdom to that same canvas, whatever's on the picture at that time. And with that, um, they're able to help us with it. So that's the value, I think, that we have added to the field of member care is providing a place. And for us now, that's a, a center located in Cannock, England, and the folks can see that on the website. But it, it also has meant that not only have we seen folks at our center, but primarily we travel to the point of need when there's a critical incident, when there's a crisis, when a family is really having difficulties. Um, it's much easier for one of us to respond than it is to maybe have a family of seven travel to us. And um, being located in at England really has provided us with a, a wonderful ministry center, which, by the way, is has been gifted to us from the Rawlings Foundation, and um, and and I think is going to have a continuing legacy. And um, I hope one day it'll be filled with clinicians from Liberty University. And I'm so thankful that God has put it on your heart and the hearts of the professors to um, to continue that folks can be. Um, well, you mentioned the whole name is so great with visas, so we're not restricted by countries that are hard to get into. So um, 
a bravo to you and them. And thanks be to God for answering our prayers, long-term prayers of supply, Lord, more workers to meet the needs because we want, we know that when a missionary or a skilled worker is encouraged, the light of the gospel shines brighter where they serve. So that's how folks back home can keep the light brighter on the field is by caring for them. And that goes back to my, one of my core ethos is, comes from Proverbs 27, 23, where we're challenged to take note, check the condition of your flocks, see how they're doing, because the guarantee of the crown being forwarded to generations, the crown for us is the legacy, the heritage, to pass that on to those coming behind us. And so to to take stock, pay attention to your flocks is basically what it's saying. And when we send them out, let's don't forget them. They're valuable. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you're getting into the nuts and bolts there a little bit, too. Like when you started talking about um, sometimes they come to you there in Canuck, England, um, which is not too far from London, I think you you it's told me in the past. Very close to Birmingham. It's actually about 25 miles from Birmingham, which is the Midlands of England. It's about two hours from okay. London by train. It's strategically, it's in a great location because it provides not only accessibility, but also it's located in a wonderful, natural, um, gorgeous forest in England called the Canic Chase. And it provides green, it provides flowers, it provides such a wonderful habitat for folks who are coming from some very dark places where they labor. It's a wonderful spot. Absolutely. So so the kinds of work you do, you, you've already mentioned consulting, counseling, training, resourcing. Mm -hmm. um, but but like, a, like our, um, I'm just thinking about a graduate student right now that might be listening and going, wow, this member care work sounds wonderful. And Maybe God's putting it on their heart, but but what are the nuts and bolts of it? Like like when you're over there and you served there for decades, um, and and you're still leading the organization, but um, what does it look like? Say there's a missionary on the field. I'll I'll make this up. Someone in Africa, and yeah. they're in a very dark place, and the work is hard, and they're depressed, and somebody tells them about, hey, there's this organization called One Another that helps people like you. What does it look like from that point for that person who wants to get some help from from you and your ministry? I think I could put a really good template for you by uh, giving you a real life situation of a missionary sure. family in Africa who found themselves caught up in a coup and in the country. And because uh -huh. that country was also governed by France, uh, the military had to go in literally and they escaped by climbing into a military tank, taken to a close airfield, lifted by a helicopter to another airport. They found themselves on an airplane going from the country at the time was Chad and going to Paris. And they're on this, they're on this airplane with lots of other evacuees that were missionaries. And one gentleman spoke to another across the aisle and said, where are you guys going to go when you get to Paris? And he said, we have no idea. And he said, you know, we went to language school there in France, but we have no idea. We just know we really need help. And this was a family with four teenagers and um, eight years of service in that country. And this other missionary opened his briefcase and handed him one of our brochures because he and his wife had, had, had been to see us to get some good situational support and he gives it to the other missionary that family when they got to paris they called us i got the call at 5 30 in the morning you know can you help us and basically and through the help of people here by the way world help was very instrumental in helping mm -hmm. us help them they had to flee in 30 minutes all they had were their papers a little backpack or a computer and um they had nothing and they were coming to us in, in back. Actually, it was February. It was cold. Uh, we had to meet their physical needs first, right? Always mm -hmm. get professional situational support first. 
But we said, get to us. If you can get to us, we'll take care of you. So it gave my colleagues and I, and this is just a scenario of how it works, of yes. saying, okay, we have people. And at that time, of course, we've always provided lodging and meals, everything that people don't need to worry about when they're coming to really meet with the Lord and to meet with someone who's going to walk alongside of them. So what that involved for them was then a critical incident debriefing. They had been traumatized mm-hmm. by this. And to hear them talk about being airlifted and leaving everything that they had loved and worked for, it's very, well, I think I have the richest gift of hearing their stories. But when they came, we had to meet their physical needs first of all. So we mm-hmm. provided lodging and meals. And um, and let me tell you, with all those teenagers, I learned they can drink a lot of milk, you know, because we, <laughs> we do the shopping and everything. Um, Uh it it was such a blessing to work with them, but then it was actually taking them to a store and that's where world help stepped in and helped us buy clothes for them. They had nothing but what they had Mm -hmm. on their backs. They needed coats. It was very warm in Chad. It wasn't real warm, even in Southern France in the winter time. So those physical needs were met, but then, um, of course we had to start the process of making them feel safe, of course, but then starting the process of the intake interview, as your students will know, um, going through what's required for them so that they feel like, hey, this is a credible place here. And Mm -hmm. also, I am safe, going through what we would provide for them. And then, of course, the intake interviews of talking with them and then assessing from that what are the big presenting problems. Well, They had been traumatized by this emergency evacuation, but they also had a lifetime of great ministry. How do we show them and give them hope that they're going to be able to continue that? So um, we did a debriefing not only for the children of that family because they needed a special a special kind of debriefing for that what affected them at their age group. And then, of course, we did the debriefing with the parents and then collectively as a family. So we're looking at the issues and what we're always looking for, what are the presenting problems? Because even before that evacuation from Chad, there were dynamics going on. So Mm -hmm. it was listening intently to the stories, figuring out what their needs were then and responding. So for anybody who comes to us, we're going to do the initial assessment, and your students will know that well. Um, we've we've got to have instruments that are reliable and credible, and we've got to do the assessments. And from the assessments, we have to make a game plan. But we're doing that with the folks that we minister to. It isn't um, an isolated situation. And then taking them through the steps, especially, and you you mentioned depression. Depression and anxiety are so high in the world right now. And thank you for your book, by the way, Healthy Depression. Um, We are so grateful for any resource that God provides. Because the good thing is, after we work with them, to be able to put something in their hands or something to take with them to reinforce the good instruction is always, always a blessing. But I want to tell you the end of that story. That family actually came back um, and... They had a wonderful agency that worked with us, and um, they stayed with us in, that was in Montpellier, France. They stayed with us for several weeks until we found them lodging where they could be as a family on their own. And then Uh when they returned to the States, it did give the, the father and the son were able to go back to the country and get a few things for them after the situation was more stable. But they ended up here in the States. And I'm happy to tell you that fast forward like 15, 17 years that the mother went back and got her training and now is working with a very credible organization. Actually, you mentioned it, but working in the area of member care and those adult children now um, to see them active in ministry and the father, it has a, has a beautiful outcome. And that's continuing that legacy 
you know, it doesn't mean that they didn't need to leave that country. They did for safety. Physical safety is always our first priority. So we make sure about that. But um, this is why it's great to work with a team because everybody has individual skills. You know, we we have a, a counselor with us, Twala Andrina, who is skilled in EMDR, in trauma therapy and grief counseling. And that alongside all of her other wonderful skills um, has just been such a blessing because we never know what story is walking through the door. So I would challenge those students who are listening please investigate all the opportunities and investigate all of the agencies who have good member care. Just understand that even pastoral care, there's always going to be that clinical side where we need you. And um, and I just say bravo again to you putting this, this certification in place for, for students, not only to get their clinical mental health training, pastoral care, whatever, but to add to it this whole discipline of member care, it's exciting. Yeah, it really is. And there's so many angles to it. And I mean, the story you just told illustrates that, you know, missionaries have crisis and trauma issues, but there's lots of other issues, just like every other client that they have as well. Um, I know uh, you've talked to me about a a specific ministry you've developed within uh, one another called Shoulder to Shoulder. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that and what kind of work you do with Shoulder to Shoulder? Sure. Um, How that began actually was working. um, I was working with a team in North Africa, a team of 86 people uh, for a retreat, a training retreat. But in that group, they asked me, would you please talk to our single workers, our never married workers? And Uh uh, and there were 20 eight of them out of 86. So that's a lot of single people. And through that time, I realized, oh my goodness, I don't really have any tangible resources to give them. By the way, there are tons of books on marriage and tons of resources for married people, but there weren't at that time a lot of resources for singles. And they are incredibly valuable resources Mm -hmm. on the field. They make great workers. They go into places where a family couldn't go. And um, they have a lot more flexibility with their time. They have the same 24 hours that you or I do, but they are incredibly valuable on the field. But I began to see and listening to the folks that I worked with. At that time, I was working with a lot of single workers who were coming from North Africa or limited and restricted access countries. And they felt very much an increase of isolation. And so going to that and realizing I don't have anything to take, but it was through Mm -hmm. that that I then contacted eight other single leaders in ministry throughout Europe. And we met on Guernsey Island and the English Channel. And we met and I just said, what can we do for this? We, We need to respond. So we prayed about it. We met a wonderful man, Dr. Barry Danleck, who was studying at Cambridge at the time and focused on a theology of singleness, which was never taught to me in school. And uh, most of the people in the field had not been introduced to that either. So when we looked at these singles, we realized the big challenge was identity. Where is my value if I'm not married and I don't have children? Um Mm -hmm. There are real messages that are sometimes negative um, to single workers, that they're not as valuable. And uh, I think, well, you and your wife know I had just come back from Spain when we had our last long conversation. And Mm -hmm. the theme of that conference was, you know, was rediscovering the strategic value of singles in kingdom leadership. And if we look at the early church, you know, We've got to continue it all. It's not just obeying the Great Commission. We have to see all the components of doing that. And singles are a great, great um, resource for that. So that's really where Shoulder to Shoulder began. And that's taken from the scripture, Zephaniah 3, 9. And it's a picture of the army of the Lord going forward to reach the nations. And um, even the Irish rugby team have this song shoulder to shoulder it shows when the strength is there 
when we are arm in arm and back to back and shoulder to shoulder, we can go forward with strength. But it also connotates um, in the area of value of identity that I'm not less valuable because I'm a single. I'm not more valuable because I'm married and vice versa. I'm not more valuable because I, I'm a parent with children. I mean, or I'm a married man or woman without children. And every culture has its views of those parental and marital situations. So it was saying, wait, we've got to add this other piece of armor to those soldiers we're sending out. And so we began this wonderful, I think is a wonderful initiative, um, shoulder to shoulder to encourage, equip and empower singles to do the work that they're called to, but also combining that with the teams. And out of that has come a wonderful resource from one of the gals that serves on our executive committee, Susie Grumelot. She and Sue Inningenberg wrote a book called Sacred Siblings. And that's really showing the spiritual family. That's the dynamic that we want to encourage and enforce. And so from that, we've done retreats, consultations, and it's been a privilege. Like in January, we met in Malaga, Spain, in the village of Mijas, and there were 40 workers there, and um, all of them, except for two, were married, but they were all single, and they represented 24 countries where they same, they serve, and they came to us from there, and yet collectively, we added up all their ages, and not, we didn't add their ages, we added the years of service they had offered on the field, and mm -hmm. that's a lot of countries represented in one small group. And there were 585 years of ministry service represented by that small, look like a small group. Well, wow, what a resource to tap into. They can be writing the books, and that's exactly what has happened. So our resources now come internally. We've developed those. And then Dr. Barry Danlack has a wonderful piece that he did with Crossway Publishing on uh, redeeming singleness. How the storyline of scripture affirms from Genesis to Revelation, the single life. So, well, let's, let's camp out here for a second. I mean, like, I know you're on to something and, and, you know, I even think about the listeners of this program. A lot of them are, you know, graduate students. Some are single by circumstance. Some are single by choice. Right. And um, there, there, there certainly is a bias in, among a lot of people in the Christian community towards married life and all that. But but there's certainly a lot you can do with your life, like you're saying, and and you mentioned you were over in Malaga, Spain, recently doing that shoulder to shoulder conference. Um, give give me a little more detail on that. Like, what are some of the topics or sessions you had with the single people that was helpful to them during that conference? I appreciate you asking that because retreats can look so diverse in in any situation. Mm -hmm especially when it's in a cross-cultural context as well. Mm -hmm. um, our retreats really, we try to make them not just retreats, uh, and we try to make them not just consultations, not all lecture. We really want them to have a time to meet new people and bond. And oh my goodness, it's amazing to watch. It's like getting a bunch of TCKs together in a room and they just, they just are like glue and come together. But um, what we focus on there is always a theological piece. That's imperative for us. And so Dr. Barry Danlack has offered that piece for us for years now. But um, the theological part is always getting to our perspective of our value in Christ, what that means for singles, what opportunities open up because of that, and um, getting to explore the gifts and skills. Um, we always have a part on, well, how does this thing with married people on my team work, you know? Uh, or how does this work if I'm serving alone? And by the way, there are many single workers who serve, I can give you many illustrations, single workers serving alone in a remote village in a restricted access country. But thankfully, their agencies have always made sure they get back out because, by the way, Kenyon, the top presenting problems of missionaries we worked with all these years still remain isolation, spiritual drought, giving out so much and not taking in. 
and fatigue um, takes energy to work and serve. And those haven't changed. So we look at those presenting problems and we look at the singles that are coming together and we do issues on sexuality, working with teams. Uh, we talk about the messages they hear and how do they reframe that. And you and I talked about, um, did a session with another coworker. We talked about what I call the Zophar messages. And these are messages that we hear from our Christian brothers and sisters, the church, platforms, resources, even, where they think what they're saying to a single person. First of all, sometimes they look at them as though they're pitiful. You know, they're not married mm -hmm. yet. Or why haven't you gotten married? And they hear these things. What's wrong with you? Or they hear, don't worry, you'll find someone and you'll be complete someday. Well, hey, I'm as complete as I am ever going to be in Christ. And so mm -hmm. we looked at some of these messages. It was like Job, his friends, maybe were well intended, but they said a lot of stuff that was so hurtful. And mm -hmm. nobody engaged the issue of holy curiosity. What is God doing in Job's life? You know, if Zophar and Elihud and Bildad, if they had just asked, wait a minute, guys, all they could do is give out what they had learned remotely, you know, the laws and they knew, you know, God would never do this if. And so it came back that surely, Job, you're the reason all these problems have happened in your life situation. Well, sometimes the church can can send those messages to single people as well. Not ill intended, but we really need to have holy curiosity. Wait a minute. You know, what what if Elizabeth Elliot had said, OK, Jim is gone, taken from me, Jim Elliot. I'm just going to hang it up and quit, you know, but she did not because she was curious enough to say, what do you want me to do, God, now as a widow? And by the way, you know, we have marrieds with children. We have marrieds without. We have singles, never been married. We have single again. And all of those components make up incredible mission agencies because they all have stories, but they all have gifts and experiences to lend to that. So we always direct something to the teams, how they work together. We always make sure there's good fellowship time and prayer time. And we always have time for questions and answers. I stood in front of that group and I just thought, my goodness, this is the greatest resource I could ever experience. They have stories, they have experiences. I've not been in some of their countries and I've not worked there long term with the team. And I just had a, a text yesterday from a gal who's going to go to her regional conference in the country where she came from. And she said, I'm going to be presenting the stuff we learned at Shoulder to Shoulder. And that's how the message goes on. But what that's doing is embedding into the DNA change of the organizations. Teach the value and the incredible opportunities before missionaries go to the field. So then we don't have to hear, I'm struggling with loneliness. And can you imagine, Kenyon, during COVID, how that mm -hmm. impacted? How that impacted our global workers. It was incredible. And we had wanted to get to these organizations and help with them with that, the pre-field. But what happened is they started coming to us. One organization said, we have 700 single workers globally, and they have thousands more. What can we do to encourage them? They are dying with isolation. Mm -hmm. And those folks in Central Asia, they could never even leave their apartments for like 12 weeks. So mm -hmm. our team got together, and by the way, we're in different time zones, you know, Budapest and Paris and England and Canada at that time. And we just did around the clock webinars helping them with how can you cope through this time? What can you do? Helping give them skills. Give me a skill that's always transferable and I can pass it on. So that's the beautiful part, the outcome of shoulder to shoulder and this week, that very team has been, um, minus me, that team's been in Budapest at the European Member Care Consortium, a consortium and consultation. 
and they've been talking about these very issues. How do we build bridges was their theme between marrieds and singles and within organizations. So, you know, you you get motivated to start for one reason and then you see the spokes develop from the hub. And that's what God has done with shoulder to shoulder. That's awesome. I see. I loved what you were just saying a minute ago about holy curiosity. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just thinking, you know, our listeners to the program right now, how would you say that applies to them? Like, let's just say there's a graduate student out there at whatever phase of life, this whole, and if I'm understanding you right, holy curiosity is asking a person, what is God doing in your life right now? Uh, is is that right? And And how would that apply to a listener of the program? Yeah, I think I think it's asking God for the perspective of wisdom and for like for those graduate students or it doesn't have to be a graduate student right now. But for other other people, no matter what stage of life they're in to say, OK, God, you've given me gifts. You, well, you've given me salvation, first of all, out of gratitude. I want to respond to your great commission. I want to be obedient to that. And I can do that anywhere physically on the globe. I can do it where I am. But how do I get from where I am now to maybe where you want me? That's where we open ourselves up to asking what's available to me. Awareness Mm -hmm. is the key to any decisions we make, right? That's what helps Mm -hmm. us take the next step. The next step. So, um, Awareness, having taking advantage of opportunities. I know Liberty offered for years. We did it. I that was my first big exposure to um, global missions was through taking teams of students to other countries and having them be exposed. Nothing is better than exposure to see the needs, but the needs don't justify the call. It's got to be a life of saying, Lord, I'm listening. What? Where do you want me? What specifically do you want me to do? How can I take this bachelor's degree that I earned and now this master's degree? Or how can I take my life of experience and combine it and serve you with it? So being aware of the needs, being exposed to them, taking the next steps means putting themselves forward. Great, great to offer um, where they're living, like for students get involved with a local counseling center or with a church that has a counseling arm or a missions arm where there is, I I know many churches that have what they call their missions care team. How do I get involved with listening to the folks that we're supporting and getting those prayer letters and responding to the needs, but um, also making sure they're constantly getting continuing education and just having them ready because immediately then a, a need will come up um, and they'll be able to say, I can respond to that now. And, you know, look at all the mission agencies that are out there. There's so many wonderful organizations. Explore with them. That would be my my piece of instruction or motivation. Explore the possibilities. It starts with that. Absolutely. Well, I tell you, Dorcas, I know from your biography on the One Another website that um, you've had an extensive missions career, I mean, and, and ministry career. You've been to 51 countries, and you've been serving now for 52 years in all different settings and a lot of member care counseling. Um, but at the same time, I know since we're friends and you've been helping me, you've been a consultant for me about all this member care work. Um, you sort of retransition back here to America. So let me ask some holy curiosity of you (laughs) at at this chapter in your life, um, since you're still working and you're still traveling the world, but you've entered somewhat of a semi-retirement, I guess. But what what is life like for you now as far as what God has for you? Well, I I actually haven't entered semi-retirement. I'm just in a new location. So I've repositioned to America. But what I'm doing now is actually asking those same questions. Okay, God, how do I now take a lifetime of experience? And I'm not trying to synthesize it, but I am trying to say, where can you use these gifts? You know, what what can I offer now? That's always been my 
premise? What can I offer? How can I contribute? And um, I did not want to leave Europe. I miss it terribly. Um, I was in France, lived there for 12 years, and England for 10. And of course, all those countries and being in contact with all those folks. And by the way, we don't just leave them. We do follow up with them after we've helped. But for me now, it means uh, hopefully reproducing myself, mentoring, coaching, being available for consultation or counseling. But I am still doing always debriefing. That is essential for missionaries coming off the field. And you can imagine in a city like Lynchburg with all the wonderful churches, there are many, many missionaries who come through here and they need a place to debrief and tell their story. So that's what I'm offering. And I do have that available from my home. And that's how we began long before we had a ministry center. We were doing this from our homes and we always had um, kind of a dedicated ministry space. And God has provided that for me to continue to offer that. So the bottom line is I look at what our what you'd see on that website, caring for those who care for the world. And that for me can be having a group of students sitting at my dining room table and talking to them. And I can give you plenty of ideas. The best thing is to listen to them. The Holy Curiosity is saying, so, you know, Sue, what what have you done the last four years and how many countries have you traveled to or have you traveled to any? What have you exposed yourself to? What needs? So and I, I say bravo, Kenyon, to all those professors who take groups of students. If they could just through the lens of time, see the possibilities of dropping those pieces of wisdom and exposure and experience into them. That is just incredible. And I pray that the heart of Liberty University will always be focused on reaching the world um, because every discipline that is offered at this school can be replicated throughout the world, um, no matter what it is. So uh, for me, I think it's having my ears open. I think it's being available. And I think it's continuing to have the holy curiosity in those that I'm working with. That's probably the best way I can answer that. Um, I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer with a, a, a prayer for God to give vision and fruit and develop member okay. care work, um, maybe here at Liberty or whatever. So we'll we'll pause for a second, then we'll start up again as if we had sure. never stopped. Well, Dorcas, you know, what's neat is your role in my life is you've been a real visionary in creating that vision for member care in me. And I'm then trying to share it with people here at Liberty because I really believe that this is the next chapter in my life and hopefully in the lives of some of our students. So, um, and we are getting to that point in time wise where we need to start wrapping it up here. But before we go today, I think it'd just be really neat. Um, if you could close us in prayer, and um, maybe pray for member care worldwide, but but also for here at Liberty. We're trying to develop this, and you're one of the chief architects behind developing what what we're going to have here as far as additional services or training for member care. So, would you close us in prayer with a, a prayer for that development of whatever God has? I'd be privileged to, Father God. I thank you so much for this time that we've had together. Uh, just a good conversation about how you are at work in our lives. And God, I just want to lift up everyone who's listening, those who are educators, those who are students, those who are just curious. Um, you have your hand and you're working in each of their lives and hearts. And so, Lord, I just want to bring this beautiful discipline of member care into their hearts and minds and explore, Lord, what are the possibilities? Would you lead them to the right resources? Father, I think what I would pray for them is that you would help them to be on a journey of authenticity, of being real with themselves and with others. Would you help them to uh, replicate that all over the globe as they obey you? Father, I pray for every worker now who is giving out your word around the world. Lord, all those points of light, 
I pray that you would find them with encouragement. Help us here to know how we can encourage them. Help us to know how we can supply them with resources. Father, would you multiply the efforts of those in member care? I think of that consultation this week in Budapest, and I pray, God, that fruit will come from that, from each one of those member care workers who themselves have been encouraged. And Lord, as we have been um, one another for years, um, I pray, God, that while we strove to care for those who care for the world, I pray, Lord, that you would raise up more workers. But those with specializations, Lord, those who want to work particularly with missionary kids, third culture kids, those who want to work with families, those who want to work with singles, those who want to work in areas of transition or trauma, all the specializations that are needed, Father, would you please raise up people to fill those areas of need and would you help Liberty University to continue to mobilize them to these points? Father, thank you for the rich heritage we've been given. Thank you for Kenyon and his vision. Would you please bless him? And Father, this program that's going forth, just pray that you will put all the pieces together. The framework will be solid. The foundation is based on obeying you. I just want to praise you for the opportunities we have and lift each of these workers, and Lord, give fruit, give vision, and may it continue on. We pray this so that you get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dorcas. My pleasure, really. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, and and listeners, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast today and learning about member care and all that God is doing around the world. There's so many neat things going on. So God bless you. Thank you again, Dorcas, and thank you listeners for joining us. And join us again next time on the Mental Healthy Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Mental Healthy. If you want to hear more episodes, please hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and head to linktree.com slash mental healthy podcast for all of our social media platforms with the latest mental healthy content. If you have a story to share that relates to what we discussed in this episode or any other episode, please contact us at mentalhealthy2020 at gmail.com. That's mentalhealthy2020 at gmail.com. Thank you, and God bless.